Chapter 1. Most of our traditional beliefs about learning are deeply flawed. Our educational system is primarily structured based on learning theories that have been passed down to us, and these are shaped by our own beliefs of what works, drawn from our personal life experiences. How we teach and study is a mix of lore, intuition, and theory. Over the last four decades, however, cognitive psychologists have been working to provide evidence to clarify what works and to discover the strategies that get results. As it turns out, most of us are really bad at learning. The learning methodologies that we've been practicing aren't serving us well. Most teachers believe that for any learning strategy to be effective, it must have two key components, intense focus and repetition. This erroneous assumption has taken root in our educational system today simply because it yields results in the short term, making both students and teachers believe that information has been assimilated. Another general misconception about learning that is very prevalent in our society is that passive, repetitive reading is the most brilliant way to learn. All over the world, the most popular study strategies with learners of all levels involve rereading texts and massed practice. The single-minded, rapid-fire repetition of a skill in order to burn it into memory. While these strategies seem like an ingenious way to learn, they are actually not very productive. Rereading and massed practice produce inherent feelings of fluency that most people erroneously believe are signs of mastery. Still, for actual knowledge or durability, these strategies are essentially a waste of time. Good learning is active learning. Learning is more effective and more durable when it's effortful. Any form of learning that is easy is like writing in sand, here today and gone tomorrow. We are easily seduced into believing that learning is better when it's easier. But different scientific studies have proven the opposite. Learning sticks better when the mind has to work. Hence, when learning is easy, it is often superficial and soon forgotten. In this summary, we will be turning most of the conventional myths about learning on their heads and we'll be highlighting some science-backed learning strategies that actually work. Chapter 2. Effortful retrieval is the best way to commit information to memory. The most effective learning strategy is retrieval practice, recalling facts or concepts or events from memory. Effortful retrieval results in stronger learning and repetition. This is largely due to the fact that actively recalling previously learned facts strengthens the memory and interrupts forgetting. While cramming can result in better scores on an immediate exam, the advantage promptly fades because there is a much greater chance of forgetting after rereading than after retrieval practice. The benefits of retrieval practice are long-term. To be most effective, retrieval has to be repeated again and again so that it becomes effortful. And the best way to approach this is by testing and quizzing yourself right after you've learned something new. For instance, flashcards. The way second graders master the multiplication tables can work just as well for learners at any stage or level of study to quiz themselves on anatomy, mathematics, or the law. Self-testing may seem unappealing and tedious because it takes more effort than rereading and cramming, but the greater the effort at retrieval, the more will be retained. Students who take practice tests have a better grasp of their progress than those who simply reread the material. Moreover, self-testing is one of the most beneficial habits a learner can develop. It promptly helps you identify your areas of strength and weakness with a topic and helps to create a more informed and beneficial learning strategy. When you don't test yourself, you will most likely overestimate how well you've mastered the material. In a nutshell, repeated recall not only makes memories more durable, but produces knowledge that can be retrieved more readily in more diverse settings, and applied to a more extensive variety of programs. Did you know, in 1978, a group of researchers discovered that cramming leads to higher scores on an immediate test, but results in faster forgetting compared to practicing retrieval. In a second test, two days after the initial test, crammers find it hard to recall over 50% of what they had been able to remember during the initial test. In his essay on memory, Aristotle wrote, Exercise in repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory. Peter C. Brown Chapter 3. Understanding the Practical Application of Retrieval Practice as a Study Strategy As we've established earlier, the best approach to retrieval practice is self-quizzing, and that as a learner, your primary study strategy should be to frequently retrieve knowledge and skill from memory, rather than rereading and cramming. 
So how exactly do you use retrieval practice as a study strategy with the main aim of increasing your productivity? Well, the golden rule is this. When you read a text or study lecture notes, take a brief pause from time to time to ask yourself some thought-provoking questions without looking at the text. Ask yourself questions like these. What are the main ideas? Which of the ideas are new to me? How would I define the terms? How do the ideas relate to the things I already know? Creating questions for yourself and writing down the answers is a great way to study. Also, a lot of textbooks have study questions at the end of the chapters, which are excellent materials for self-quizzing. Testing yourself on the main ideas and the meanings behind the terms helps you to concentrate on the central precepts rather than on peripheral material or on your teacher's turn of phrase. So, every week throughout the semester, set aside a little time to quiz yourself on the material in a course, both the current week's work and materials covered in the previous weeks. As you quiz yourself, however, always check your answers to ensure that you have accurate judgments of what you know and don't know. This way, you can use quizzing to identify areas of weak mastery and focus your study to make them strong. Also, during your recall exercises, there are going to be some instances where you constantly make mistakes or find it really hard to recall some information. Even though this seems discouraging and frustrating, it is actually a good thing in disguise. The reason is that the harder it is for you to recall new learning from memory, the greater the benefit of doing so. Making mistakes will not set you back as long as you check your answers and rectify your errors. Chapter 4. Augment your retrieval practice strategy with spaced repetition. Once you've adopted the retrieval practice as your study strategy, the next step is to augment it with spaced repetition. In essence, spaced practice means studying information more than once, but leaving considerable time between practice sessions. Without leaving enough time between your retrieval practices, all you will be doing is mindless repetition of the material. After an initial test, delaying subsequent retrieval practice is more effective for strengthening retention than immediate practice because delayed retrieval requires more effort. When you are feeling more confident about your mastery of a particular material, test yourself on it once a month. When you space out practicing a task and start to forget some of the information between sessions, Retrieval is more difficult and feels less productive, but the effort yields longer-lasting learning and enables a more versatile application of it in later settings. So, how exactly do you use spaced practice as a study strategy? Basically, all you have to do is establish a schedule of self-quizzing that allows time to elapse between study sessions. How much time you leave between each study session depends on the material. For instance, if you're learning a set of names and faces, you will need to review them within a few minutes of your first encounter, because associations like these are forgotten quickly. Some materials, on the other hand, may need to be revised within a day or so of your first encounter. Then, probably not again for several days or a week. Chapter 5. Reconstructing the things you learned from long-term memory will strengthen your mastery. As you quiz yourself on new materials over the course of a study period, make sure you reach back to revise prior material and try to think of how that knowledge relates to what you have subsequently learned. If you use flashcards, don't stop testing yourself on some cards just because you answer them correctly a couple of times. Keep on shuffling them into the deck until they're well mastered. Only then set them aside, but in a pile that you revisit regularly, maybe monthly. Anything you want to learn and retain must be periodically recalled from memory. The effectiveness of spaced repetition arises from the fact that you would have forgotten at least a little bit of the materials you studied in your last practice, making you work harder to reconstruct that previously understood concept. In effect, you're reloading it from long-term memory. The conscious effort to reconstruct the learning makes the essential ideas more conspicuous and memorable and connects them more securely to other knowledge and to more recent learning. Spaced repetition is a pretty powerful approach to learning, but learners often find it very tedious. Yes, massed practice and cramming feel more productive than spaced practice, but they are not. Compared to all the popular study approaches out there, the reason why spaced practice feels more difficult and tiresome is that you would have gotten a little rusty over time, making the material quite harder to recall. It feels like you're not really getting on top of it, but in the real sense, quite the opposite is happening. As you reconstruct learning from long-term memory, as awkward and unproductive as it feels, you are strengthening your mastery as well as the memory.
It's a common myth that you can burn something into memory through mere repetition. Lots of practice is effective, but only if it's spaced. Peter C. Brown Chapter 6 Develop the ability to distinguish between different kinds of problems. Once you've mastered the art of retrieval practice and spaced repetition, then it's time to add interleaving to your learning skill set. Interleaving is all about studying more than one type of problem within a topic at a time and scattering problem types through your practice schedule. If you're trying to master some formulas in physics, for instance, study more than one type at a time so that you are alternating between different problems that require absolutely distinct solutions. And if you're studying organic chemistry, biology specimens, or the principles of macroeconomics, mix up the examples. Most of the textbooks used in schools today are structured in study blocks. That is, they present the solution to a particular kind of problem and supply many examples to solve before moving to another kind of problem. Unfortunately, blocked practice isn't as effective as interleaved practice. So, if you want to get the absolute best of your study sessions, here's what to do. As you organize your study regimen, look out for new problem types you understand, but your grasp of them is still rudimentary. Once you've identified them, scatter these problem types throughout your practice sequence so that you are alternating quizzing yourself on various problem types and retrieving the right answers for each. The practice of two or more subjects or skills, interleaving, is a highly effective alternative to massed practice. Peter C. Brown Chapter 7 Make repetitive practice interesting by mixing up different subjects. Whenever you find yourself slipping into a single-minded, repetitive practice of a particular topic or skill, switch things up a little. Mix in the practice of other subjects or skills. This will constantly challenge your ability to recognize the problem type and choose the right answer. Consider a baseball player who practices batting by swinging at 20 fastballs, then at 20 curveballs, and then at 20 changeups. This type of player will perform better in practice than the player who mixes it up. However, the player who mixes things up by swinging at different pitches during training builds his ability to decipher and respond to each pitch as it comes his way during matches, thereby becoming the better hitter. A vast majority of learners focus on many examples of one problem or specimen type at a time, wanting to master the type and hammer it down before proceeding to study another type. The problem with this type of approach, blocked practice, is that it is grossly inefficient even though it feels and looks like you're getting better mastery the more you do it. While interrupting the study of one practice to practice a different type, interleaving, feels disruptive and counterproductive, it is a very potent tool for achieving mastery. By mixing up problem types and specimens, you are inherently improving your ability to discriminate between different types of problems and identify the unifying features within a particular type. In effect, this improves your success in a later test or in real-world settings where you must discern the kind of problem you're trying to solve in order to apply the accurate solution. Chapter 8. Create Memory Cues Using Elaboration, Mnemonics, and Reflection One of the easiest ways to make your learning effective and productive is by creating mental models with every new information you encounter. Mental models help you integrate complex sets of interrelated ideas or skills into a meaningful whole, subsequently bolstering your retention ability and the mastery of your field. Elaboration is one of the best and easiest means of creating mental models with information. Basically, elaboration involves finding additional layers of meaning in new material. Say, relating the material to what you already know, explaining it to somebody else in your own words, or explaining how it relates to your life outside of class. Elaboration enhances your mastery of new material and increases the mental cues available to you for later recall and application of it. A highly effective way to elaborate on the main idea of any new material is to create a metaphor or visual image for it. For instance, to have a solid understanding of the principles of angular momentum in physics, just picture how much faster a figure skater's rotation becomes as her arms are drawn into her body. In the same vein, to better grasp the principles of heat transfer, you can relate conduction to warming your hands around a hot cup of coffee, radiation to the way the sun pools in the den on a wintry day, and convection to the life-saving blast of AC on a hot, humid day. The more you can elaborate on how new learning relates to the things you already know, the stronger your grasp of the new things will be and the more mental connections you create to retain and retrieve it later. 
Chapter 9. Make your mind more receptive to new learning by practicing generation. Generation involves trying to answer a question or solve a problem before being shown the answer or the solution. When reading new class material, for instance, you can practice generation by trying to explain beforehand the main ideas you expect to find in the material and how you expect they will relate to your prior knowledge. Once you've puzzled through it, you can then go ahead and read the material to see if you were correct. And just because you've made the initial effort, you will be more astute at understanding and retaining the key idea and relevance of the reading material, even if it differs from your expectations. Another way you can properly create vivid mental models for information is by reflection. To reflect, all you have to do is take a few minutes to review what you've learned in a recent class or experience and ask yourself thought-provoking questions. What went well? What could have gone better? What other things does this experience remind you of? And what strategies might you use for better mastery or to get better results next time? Lastly, you can retain what you've learned and hold arbitrary information in memory by using mnemonic devices. The word mnemonic is derived from the ancient Greek word mnemonikos, which translates to of memory or relating to memory. Mnemonic devices are like mental file cabinets that give you handy ways to store information and find it again when you need it. For instance, some school children are taught a very simple mnemonic for remembering the U.S. Great Lakes. Ontario, Erie, Huron, Michigan, Superior. In geographic order, from east to west, old elephants have musty skin. And if you've ever learned anatomy, you probably know the popular mnemonic used to remember the six bones of the skull. Old people from Texas eat spiders, which stands for occipital, frontal, temporal, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones anatomically. By using mnemonics in learning, you will be able to hold a large volume of new material in memory cued for ready recall. Conclusion A common myth about learning is that passive, repetitive reading is the smartest way to learn. All over the world, the most popular study strategies with learners of all levels involve rereading texts, massed practice, the single-minded, rapid-fire repetition of a skill in order to burn it into memory, is also a favorite study strategy. These strategies sure do seem like a smart way to learn, but in truth, they are grossly counterproductive. Rereading and massed practice produce inherent feelings of fluency that most people mistake for signs of mastery. However, for actual knowledge or durability, these strategies are essentially a waste of time. Good learning is active learning, and active learning is all about learning hard and smart. Learning is more effective and durable when it's effortful. When learning is easy, it is often superficial and soon forgotten. So, to commit skills and information to memory, you have to use effortful, active retrieval spaced out over a period of time to recall things you've learned from memory. The effort you put into active retrieval and spaced repetition produces long-lasting learning and enables a quite versatile application of it in later settings. The more effortful the retrieval, the stronger the benefit. All in all, if you develop a habit of regular retrieval practice throughout the course of your studies as a learner, you won't have any need to cram material or go on all-nighters. In fact, you will need very little studying at exam time. Reviewing the material the night before is much easier than trying to cram it. Try this. Quizzing is the antidote for forgetfulness. Periodically practicing freshly acquired knowledge and skills through self-quizzing strengthens your learning of it and your ability to relate it to previous knowledge. So while trying to master a study material, Set aside a little time to quiz yourself on it daily.